was a time that if you felt that something was extremely important, that you would not fight for it, but present it and say, I believe in this. We need to at least try it. Can Whether it was with a network, whether it was with a producer, um, you were a director's hire. And I think what I miss now is that there isn't the time for explanation. So very often, too often, one will get a message that something isn't correct. But you don't know for whom it is right or wrong. And the anonymity of the what appears to be arbitrary change is quite painful. But what I've learned is that those of us that thought that we would go and say, please listen to me, you know, please look again at this. Can I please have the time? Who objects to this? But now you realize that those people really are in a position to make those decisions and that they have to be respected sometimes without question. And I miss the discourse. I miss it terribly. I know that there aren't a lot of political moments in Sorosky Crystal. And I have learned to try not to argue for shoes in a headshot, which I say often. But there are still the opportunities that when you work to make it a company, we still can do that. And those of us that really feel that we're not being heard, there's nothing wrong with being a costume designer as well as a producer, as well as a production designer. Because what I've learned at this point in my career is that it is an honor to be a costume designer, but what I would like to be known as is a filmmaker. And it's okay to be part of. I just, I think that it's a time though where because the prep time, if you haven't worked with somebody, let's say nine times, 10 times, if you don't have that rapport and you're called in, it's you, to get that trust, it takes quite a while. So I believe that the flexibility and the reminder that for every idea that you have, that they're many, many more, and that it isn't the point at the end of saying, um, I should have done this. It's that you had so many more choices. In Frida, there was a baby, and the, the, the baby, they didn't put the tiny pantalones on, so there was a diaper, you know, and you think, why couldn't I run on stage and do that, right, you know? Well, you can, and what I've learned from many of the people I've worked with is I say, they say, oh, we can't go there. No, 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 it's, they're gonna be rolling soon, and uh, I don't wanna be thrown off, and I say, have you never been thrown off a set? <laughs> I, I, I marvel at that, I, I marvel. I'm, I'm thrown off a set constantly, but, the ninth time, maybe you get a chance to go for broke. I hope that the capacity to question in those that are just starting, I believe that you have to be careful because when, when we began, if you were replaced, it was a terrible, terrible thing. You hadn't heard of that. And now to be replaced means that maybe there's somebody who understands something, who 
greater than you. Maybe you needed more crew and that person can come in and say, we need this and be heard on a different level. The one thing that hasn't changed is our capacity to design, to read a script instead of having characters look like us. That when we walk in to an interview and have the director or the producer look at us to know that the characters don't have to look like us, that we're trained to do so many things. The fact that we cannot work easily anywhere. I would love if there is something uh, that happens in the future, I call it the Paisley Passport. As designers, we are trained to do everything and we shouldn't be classified. I was very lucky to do Frida as a non-Latino woman. Then my responsibility comes that not only do you make sure that you have a crew, but that you're able to train that crew, not necessarily, God forbid, to copy yourself, but to at least say, well, either I want to work this way or I have a better way to work. And that if you have an assistant costume designer and they're too opinionated and you find them going, oh, God, you know, nobody complained about this. It's fine. Um, I could do it much faster. As soon as you hear them complaining on the other side of the rack and they can't <laughs> hear you, you get that person a job. You pull them out and you say, okay, you have these opinions. I will help you find work. We cannot hide our assistance. And we have to be able to, it will take a while, to make sure that it is not from whence you came for how you design, but it is what you can bring. I say this so many times, but those on the outside of the circle can see more. And I think that I've learned the most from the strongest actors, from the actors who will take time and say, look again, look again. The actors that I was terrified of when I first started, those were the people who took extra time with me, even though Betty Davis hated the way I sat. She couldn't believe it, or my shoes you know, or horizontal stripes. I can hear her now going, why? But <laughs> on the other hand, what she did do is say, I can help you. And if you persist to act the way you do, to be have these opinions, you need an agent who is completely different who will represent you not in the same way that you represent yourself. And um, she gave me her agent. Now, I think that those who we are told don't listen to them, they're difficult. Usually that level of, difficult, of difficulty comes from, a, I believe, an inside lack of validation. It's very hard to imagine that working um, with Peter Dinklish on my dinner with Hervé, and I really didn't love Hervé Velicese. And yet if somebody asked me what I would remember, it was de plain, de plain, not who he was as an actor. When I learned to look again, look again, look again. If those are the stories that I can be part of, you know, you take somebody like Alfred Hitchcock 
and you look at his physicality and you look at his life and you look at the women that he picks and that who he can have because of power. And you take this, there has to be a way to turn it around without any level of the vile that comes, the bile that comes from the self-loathing. However, if you can look at a character and you find that, it's not when they look their best. It's when they wash their face and they stand and they see that one moment who they really are. And in that fitting room, again, it's something that I say over and over again, you have those costumes. And I would rather be able to have the costumes become clothing. It's something I think maybe I can offer. Although I must say that people like Rhett Turner and Bob Mackey and Ray Agian, Ray Agian, they were great to me. I worked on the Sonny and Cher show in a prison at night. And when I was in the prison, all they wanted was not to know, you know, what it's like to have the freedom of imagination. They wanted a little swatch from Cher. But to get back to the costumes, if you look at Frida, you can see that the costumes came from everywhere. They, every shop helped me. I wish that when I walked in, people didn't think, oh my God, she's going to ask for a deal. But the point is, is that some of the best stories don't have the best backing. And I do say at Western, I do say, read the script. If you believe in the script, please help me, you know? And it's not a rose of therapy. It really isn't. It's not easier just to say yes to me. It is because I want the excitement. I want that elevation, that, that moment that you see that there's a reason that we don't work alone. There's a reason we can't work alone. We need it. It doesn't matter if, if as a designer, you're the best tailor, you're the best uh, shopper. What matters is, is that you find the best who are willing to give what they have and know that when they're on their own, there will still be things left. You know, we should not have the secrets that we have. The age of covered sketches, it's over, it's over. If you look at Frida, those clothes came from everywhere. The Tejuana, the um, heavily embroidered top uh, and matching skirt that, that Frida wore when uh, on her deathbed, that was a bridal outfit that I found, that we found, there was, that, that we all found, the word came out, and this woman came forward and said she was about to be married and that she would love it if Frida Kahlo wore that. Then word got out that in Mex on the streets in Mexico City that I would trade things. And many of the things were traded. And some came from Palace, some came from Western, um, some came from motion pictures, some came... It came from everywhere. And in Mexico, what was surprising is that the Mexican, the crew that I had, in the beginning, um, they did not care for me, nor did they care for the way that I worked. And um, there's a red dress that, um, uh, Selma Hayek wears when she's dancing. Um, and we tried, we made this really beautiful dress, but it just wasn't alive. It wasn't alive. And I had a red dress, and we literally took the front and the back and then cut out the panels 
and put it on her so that she could be inside that. And Ashley Judd's, we were so out of funds at that point, was two pieces of fabric, and then it was the beads that held them together. So it really wasn't about a great costume. It was how it was going to be used, entrances and exits, saying, touch me, don't touch me. Um, I believe that in Frida, that it was color. I keep saying that, you know. I, I was going to ask you. No uh, budget for color. How, how much uh, did you and Julie Tamer discuss the color schemes in it? Because so much of the color in the movie seems kind of desaturated and pulled back. And then she'll show up in these red dresses and just leap out of the, the picture. How much? Well, I think that um, <coughs> that the information was there. So you would look at those pictures, and you would look at the paintings. So I say pictures because there were many photographs and many paintings. Some paintings had to come to life. So what one provided uh, Julie Taymor with were those tools. So if there was yellow, she would find that. The red was very uh, much part of the story because it matched the uh, picture, uh, the, the painting that Frida did. And, when, and the school uniforms, it was um, difficult trying to um, make sure that Frida looked young and went from young to senior. So you, it wasn't that she looked 15 or 14 or 13. It had to do with how we remember ourselves being young. So I think another responsibility of a costume designer is to find that thread in everyone who is watching a film so that you can bring them into it. What is their memory? Um, a political moment and something that I felt was so important was the fact that when we think of Mexico, we think uh, in the 20s, in the 30s, in the 40s, in the 50s, too often we think of peasants rather than this intelligentsia, rather than this society, to show the elegance of Mexico was extremely important. And, um, and also the fact that Frida didn't wait to be looked at. I think the test of Frida Kahlo was, if there was no one around, would she still dress in a unique way? And when you walk down the street, you know, I say this often, there are people who say, look at me. And, and there's nothing wrong with copying anybody. Nothing, if it makes you feel okay. But the danger of being a costume designer who takes characters and copies what the style is, unless it's dictated by the script, is I believe that the camera will go flat because there's the person, and there, there is clothing or a costume on them, but it's in front of them. And I think you, that's why I think period costumes, like doing, I guess this isn't the theater, but doing Macbeth on Broadway, the armor, it's not so much the armor. The armor is so beautiful. I love armor. But I also love when someone has to help the person take the armor off and the red marks left from a corset and the pain and the breath. The great thing about Frida, one of them, is many people don't, they don't think she was such a great artist, but it was her independence 
And I think, again, that I feel at this point in my career that I don't want to be called somebody who fights for something. I want to be part of a cause. And that cause is growth and not fear of keeping sameness. And those are the scripts that kind of sneak into the screen like the blob and go under the seats and go around you. And at, at the end, until the next day, you realize that maybe you have indeed learned something. Now, I guess I sh should let you talk, huh? <laughs> but you've been sitting here like a bump on a log. I, well, I, th I think we should begin at the beginning. Um, you started in the theater and in television, and it was... It was um, I did get into television later. That was not, not later. Okay. Well, when you were in the theater, it, was, um, it sounded like it was a pretty grueling pace. And what were the lessons that the theater taught you? I think that the theater, film, television, opera, I think people say that they're so different. But they're not. Our goal still is to make that character, that conversation alive and, that it, and to make sure that it keeps going in the lobby when it's over, even at Radio City uh, Music Hall, even working there, you need to sneak out an intermission, go at the end, and hope that that, as I say, that that, that river of thought keeps going. And if it's enjoyable, and if it's something to make people laugh, then they'll laugh in the car on the way home. Um, I think that the one thing that is different in the theater is that you have rehearsal time. But after work, and that you do your sketches, or you don't do sketches, and you do the sketches after something, a costume is done. I used to think that that was terrible, you know, that you would do these sketches, and then any sketches that were shown were done after a production. And I thought, oh no, this you can't do that. You can't go after it, the movie's on and, and sketch or the, the play is going. But now I think that that must be done because where is the actor? Where is the story going? Where is that great moment of explosion between the two people or uh, somebody looking out into an audience and getting something back or looking around? Those are things that mean that you're going to draw that or create that during the story. Now, it became increasingly difficult for me because I would do the sketches ahead of time and then you watch rehearsal and that's why at dress rehearsal they go, oh no, this doesn't work or this doesn't work. And those are horrible nights, the, first, the night before the first preview. But when you bring that into film, you realize that you, unless it's a um, fairly long prep period, which many films can't afford unless they're the very large ones, I hope that's accurate, um, you, you, you want that prep time, but you also have to be prepared at the last minute to change it. On the smaller budget, movies, the actors aren't available. And you used to, uh, when I first started, a costume designer would be hired and very often to do the costumes and not finish the whole movie. Uh, not, not finish it, but not be on the movie until the very end. But now, in order to get the best actors, you might not get an actor until five weeks in because you, you work around that availability. So you need to, uh, I want to be on it. And I think people don't understand that. Um, I guess it was on The Ring, um, it was set up and a new actor came in. And I came back 
and I was sitting there and I had watched a scene and it was exciting and I was having lunch and somebody said, why are you here? Don't you have something else to do? And it was so painful because part of what I love so much is to watch that scene, to learn from that scene, to watch that camera go crazy. Yeah, how can any kind of participation like that be bad? I mean, because I, because it's not economically necessary if the clothes are finished. You have a great crew; they can carry it out. But I personally, there's nothing wrong with designing that way. Absolutely nothing. Having everything ready, having it set up, and I wish I could work that way. But something happens where you watch a rehearsal and you get a new idea. So you have to have um, a crew that doesn't think, I don't use the C word very much, but the word chaos. I don't feel that if you're searching for something better, that that is chaos. And I don't, I would hope, because I do work with the same people over and over again, that I would never be accused of a Pyrrhic victory, which is, of course, that you have these great costumes, but the troops are dead. <laughs> you know? So you're there, you know, and everybody's helped you create them. You didn't do them yourself, but you turn around and, you know, the medic is uh, quite busy that afternoon. I have, a, I have a general question. Um, Did I, that answer that kind of? Any answer you give me is a good answer. Because, I'm serious. No, like, because I just, there's I, ways of answering. You can answer like in a precise way, or you can circle and eventually land the plane, which means that many other questions have been answered, you know, through that. That plane ride was a great pleasure. No, it was wonderful. No, I'm not kidding you. You're a great storyteller. I'm just, I, I just, I'm, I'm here to facilitate. This is, but um, no, I was gonna say, um, I, I love your sketches, and they're almost more like collages. You know, so often when you see costume design sketches, they're, they're very, no, 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 very no, 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 oh, but, boom, but, stop. But, yes. If you take somebody, let's say like May Routh, who's here, or you take uh, Bob Mackey. There were, you take um, Theodore Van Runkle, I think, did I say Theodore? Dorothy Jeekins. You take these people, and I watch them. I assisted Dorothy Jeekins. And Dorothy Jeekins, she was tall, and she would design like this. And the flowers would go down one side, and I would be working on atmosphere, and I'd have flowers like this, and she would call. She didn't like Julie. She would say, now, Julia, we shall take these and put these straight down. I mean, she was. it was wonderful, and I wish that I could prick my finger, and it, watching her draw, you know, she could do light and shade without whiteout or toothpaste. I, I, it was extraordinary, and to hear Bob Mackey's markers go when you have erased so much that you've gone through to the next piece of paper under, I, I mean, and yet all these people helped me. On Blades of Glory, I needed help Ooh, because they added a scene and then all of a sudden they were like, they would bring in people, let's say from, Eastern Europe, they would fly them in overnight because they could do like a, a four tumbling piece, you know? And uh, and I needed help. So I went to Ray, and he was still a little annoyed because one of the costumes that, I don't know if anybody saw that movie, but there's a blue costume that John Heater wears. And the way that it was done is with those, um, you know, those tag guns, and then it's sewn on afterwards. But in the story, John Heater didn't have much time to have his costume made. And I walked in and I said, no, 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 leave them, leave them. <laughs> you know, the shop said, oh, no, please. You know, we have our pride. I said, the next one will be right, but you must leave those. 
So um, Ray said, and I'm not proud of this, that uh, I came in and I said, I have a little problem. I need this. Please, please make this costume. And it was a tough one. And he said, we can't. We have these, you know, we have a cruise do uh, that, that's being designed. We have a television show that is being designed. They were swamped. And I said, yes, you're swamped. And look at your shop. They are so nervous and agitated what if I just set up a little place outside and they could put the crystal on and make things and have you know I think they would enjoy it it would be a nice break and he said I will do it but you're not allowed in you have to sit and do a sketch that is so clear you know no coffee stains for the leg of mutton sleeve leg of mutton sleeve you know, you have to do this sketch so precise that it would be built the way that you draw. I mean, I was crying. I said, okay, oh, no. I mean, it was so hard to take your process out and be generous enough to allow a shop the freedom of not guessing if they had it right or wrong, you know. And Albert Walski, can I tell one more story? By all means. So it was my first Broadway show, and it, we did it off-Broadway, and it was Elephant Man, and we did it for $100 each. We read this script, and we thought, oh, my God, what is this? What is this? You know, and, of course, and I had the next one was pee off, and, and if you look at, Hopefully, if there's anything that, if anybody can say something about the work, it's that one day you're mocked and the next day you're accepted. And I'm almost finished. What? I have to say that I was never so proud in my life as when I was at the Bagel Bully exhibit oh, in, oh, in New York, oh, I, in Brooklyn, at the Brooklyn Museum. I was On the so last proud. Day of the Yeah, but you know what it was? I know what it was, exactly. Because he had Issey Miyake. He had uh, Yoji Yamamoto, uh, Matsuda, his own designs. It was magnificent. I'm okay. telling you, magnificent, Ziggy. And then there was a little box. And what did it have in it? It had No, it was his loincloth. Loin <laughs> this old, dirty so loincloth that he had kept from Elephant Man. And do you know how many millions of dollars David Bowie's loincloth is worth at this point? <laughs> not as Pat much. Pat yourself on no, the back. No, wait, not as much as Dolph Lundgren's uh, red um, bikini that was ended up in a Palm Springs thrift shop. And then it, it sold for quite a bit of money. But um it wasn't in David Bowie's No. But um my very, very first Broadway show and it was called Halloween. And again the life uh the sentence was uh, my life is fantasy, it's more than real. It's a man who it's like Pirandello, he's institutionalized. And he, when he comes out, he realizes that the world that he had made up isn't so bad, you know. And um, so what happened was that uh, the gentleman who made these chamois, there was a group of, of monks, and they were all made out of chamois. And they were kind of boring. And so I asked the cutter fitter, um, Jesse, I said, Jesse, how would you feel if they just wore them inside out. It's so much, I mean, he was so angry. And as he was saying, can't you take anything seriously? I said, I am. Look at these, look at these edges. We can put dirt underneath them. And Albert Walski said, no, it happens very often that somebody puts a sleeve in upside down. Let's just try it the other way. And I thought, who is this man? who can bring peace and make it so lovely to Albert, have to Albert do something lovely, lovely over man. again. But 
to those of you here who haven't fallen asleep and are just beginning, everybody helped me. Designers helped me. Everybody helped me. Everyone. Shops. They. You were, say, you were saying Tony Walton and Henry Fonda and all these extraordinary people. Extraordinary people. Everybody helped. They did. Um, that didn't mean that they liked my stories, but <laughs> they still helped me. Mr. Fonda couldn't stand them. Betty Davis would go, will this take long? I mean, no, no, nobody did. Uh, and what you realize at, at a point, and I think it's interesting that it took me a long time to realize this. For me, it was the senior actors who were ready to talk, who would say, look again, take a look. Um, and I was lucky. I was very young, and though, and they really were at a point where they would say, "Let me tell you how this was done before." You know. So instead of thinking that somebody who thought, "Well, this isn't the way it's done," you listen and you imagine. What what kind of input did they give you on your costumes? Well, um, Marlon Brando was interesting because he was very large at that time. What happens is, is that he was supposed to come in like uh, four or five weeks earlier, and he didn't. And it was like six days before. And he came and he, he brought me very close to him. And he said, it's going to be all right. You know? And I thought, you know, uh-uh. He's not going to, I'm not going to melt. I'm not, you know, I can't talk the way to, don't worry, you'll come up with something. And then he held me quite close, which would not be allowed now at all. But he really didn't, I mean, it was nothing. And he said, tell me, what are you really thinking? And our guts were touching each other. And I said, you know, I think it's an interesting type of birth control. But, you know, uh, it, 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 and slowly um, we got to know each other, slowly, very, very slowly. And when, for people like Robert Duvall, who you think are going to do something in one take, and people like Marlon Brando, you say to your crew, forget continuity. Get to the set as fast as you can. You're never going to see this again. And Brando would call me once a year, just once a year, just once a year. And I'd go, oh, you know who this is, and we go. But the thing is, you didn't, because you had all these friends that would call and you and pretend they were Marlon Brando, you know? <laughs> you, you didn't. You know, and they would do good imitations. They were terrible. Nobody impersonated Marlon Brando. <laughs> yeah, Come on, they would call how like you that. doing? But at 2 in the morning, he would call. Can I tell that one? Yes, please. Oh, this is funny. And one night, he read The Highwayman. And I thought, oh my God. And I mean, it was just like extraordinary. So being a, a woman without an ego, a person without an ego, I thought, well, maybe I can read a poem to him, right? And he never answered his phone, yeah. ever. And I called him and he answered and I said, um, Marlon, I would like to read you this poem, and it was this this paragraph, and it was the last paragraph of James Joyce's Ulysses, which is "Yes, I will. Yes, I will. Yes." And I got to like four yeses, and I hear this snoring, <laughs> and I thought, you know what, Kimberly, you know this story. I'm sleeping with Marlon Brando. <laughs> So, I don't know, I guess it was about 20 minutes, and I just listened to him snore, and I thought, this is fabulous. This isn't going to happen again in my life. I have to say, after, after Julie and I met, there was one story in particular uh -oh. that absolutely, absolutely had me laughing my ass off over and over again. Um, can I tell this, the, 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 the schmaltz? The, this is, I love this story. You go ahead, please. <laughs> this is so funny. Please, by all means. Because you'll tell the short version. 
you tell the long version. This is this is like no. my I had okay. my mom like peeing herself laughing. No. So, this story. This is so I good. got um, <laughs> nominated. I was think it, it was twelve, 12 monkeys. monkeys? Yeah. Yes, and um, this very attractive, tall young man is at the door, and there is the most you know the story the most beautiful mound of roses that I, I think I've really ever seen, and it go it went from uh, pale uh, pink to red to coral. It was just beautiful. And I said, um, I think it was Marlon's son, and I said, please tell Marlon, these are just magnificent. And he said, okay. Then he just stood there, and I said, would you like some water? He said, no. I said, well, then I waited again, and I said, do you need to use a bathroom? He said, no. And he said, here, and he left. And it was a jar of chicken fat, and it said schmaltz, and it said Rabbi Bredinsky on it. And what it meant is, okay, so you got nominated, but this isn't why you work. It's schmaltz. The award is chicken fat. That's what it is. So I kept it in my refrigerator, and after about a year, my refrigerator started smelling really badly. So. I had to take it out, and then when I tried to wash it out, you know, the letters, it kind of ran. And it was the only time I ever did this. I saw him, I think, once more, and I made him write over it. I said, you know, you can't give somebody chicken fat, Marlon, if they want to keep it. You know, it's it's agitating. It smells everything up. But um, he he taught, I mean, he was a great teacher. and. The these actors have a lot to say, even if they're not talking, in the way that that they handle themselves. And I I think that I learn a great deal from uh, from just watching their interpretations of the character. There was a really interesting story you told me about Robert Duvall and and a costume. Where he had, um, he said it was the wrong costume. Oh, but it was that the, was terrible. This is fascinating. No, it's a terrible story. So, it was raining. Robert Duvall's trailer was far uh, away, and um, I, I went running back, and um, he said that the shirt felt different, and I said, no, no. Robert, it's the same shirt, but it wasn't. It was the double. It was the second one that hadn't been washed the same amount of, of time. But um, I mean, they, I'm very lucky that people are just take the time to teach, and I would hope that we can do that amongst ourselves. There was a really interesting story you told me about working funny. with um, Robert Town on Tequila Sunrise, about it, the lessons he taught well, you. Well, Robert Town is such a brilliant writer. I mean, uh, Chinatown, we know that. And this was uh, a movie he was directing, and he was he was tough. And I was at a point, I, w I was starting, and Dick Silbert and Milena Cannonaro had recommended me. And I had not learned the proper way to have a fitting for, and the clothes, you know, they were in piles. And I think he got very nervous, and um, Dick Silbert had to come and say, it's okay, it's okay. But the great lesson is from the difference between Robert Town and Andrew Bergman, who did Honeymoon in Vegas, which... You know, one of the Elvises landed on a, a telephone wire and thought he was going to be electrocuted, and so he walked out of his costume, and it was hanging there, you know. And um, the, we needed all these lights. I'll get back to Robert Town. It does make sense. And we needed all of these lights for uh, Honeymoon in Vegas for the costumes. And I only knew about Disney on Parade at that point. And they were kind enough to send uh, 
uh, the lights. And so we put them on and they lit up at night. But the problem was is that they were supposed to land in the sand and instead they kept landing in a parking lot and rolling over and breaking the twinkle lights. And I would be running going, get over there, get over there, you know, with the parachutes. And, and finally, um, Disney called and said, what are they doing, falling out of the sky? You know, and then we had to get papers, and uh, it, it was um, difficult. But when Andy Bergman uses the word pink, it's like bubblegum. It's like, it's very girl-like. But when Robert Town says pink, it's hot pink. It's Algerian pink. It's a different color. I think it's important to say that I wish at that time, I mean, when we think about Marlon Brando and we think about Last Tango in Paris, and when we think about these things that occurred on the set, and I was silent, and I didn't, and it wasn't Robert Town and it wasn't Marlon Brando, but I think all of us here have seen much and have said nothing. And I think as times are changing, um, it is different now. I think that um, the voices of, of men and women, um, I think we can now hopefully go forward, that there hopefully is this evenness of conversation. I don't think we're there yet, but um, it's something that I don't think when I started, I knew the civil rights, I knew about equality, but I still didn't know how not to be afraid to answer without making it something funny. And uh, those are uh, definitely interesting lessons. Well, I was going to say, um, we'd like to open up to the audience, um, shoot. Julie. So in Frida, I always wondered, since you're an artist, and did you bring any of yourself as a painter to your designs of another painter? Like, how did that translate into your design work? Did you consider? No. No, not at because all? Because I don't think of myself... Um, as a single artist, uh, I there was a time, but then I knew that it was hard for me to stay on the canvas. And I ended up taking independent study classes because something would happen and I would go off the canvas and down the street. And it was very hard just to stay on that one piece of paper. and. As odd as this might sound, if I did paint, there were times, and this was in the late 60s, where there would be more of me on a canvas than I thought was inside of me, and you'd have to have the TV on. And I needed the world of the of theater film. I needed a company that had a, what you were part of. I needed to be part of. I don't think that I could sign my work as a single artist. Lola, who is here, who uh, has a studio where I have one, thinks I should go back to drawing and things like that. But uh, at this point, anyway, it's a big compliment. All right, anybody have any questions? I know it's getting late. Don't feel like you're chewing gum to the chairs. I thought it was unusual, and I wonder if you do, that both Selma and Alfred were chosen to play their younger selves. And how did you approach designing for them as their younger selves and then later as their mature selves? Because I think that... There is, I think that there is a tragedy instead of starting with somebody young, 
you start with somebody much older trying to be young. And then you can go backwards. Diane Lane was, uh, we worked on a piece called Hollywoodland. And it was getting to the end of, of time had passed. And I, uh, there was this dress that she was going to put on. And, you know, it could have been a formal dress. It could have been. But instead, we decided to give her a younger dress. And to watch her at, she was playing at that point somebody substantially older, put that dress on and slowly feel the uh, exuberance, the uh, ebullience, if that's the right pronunciation, uh, the joy of that youth coming up, you know, and the heart and the brain and everything just becoming full tilt boogie. Because I think that um, if you have that opportunity, you see, you saw uh, Frida much older. And, of course, the makeup helped tremendously. But she also never lost her spunk. And so to make her younger was, um, I don't think, that difficult. You also go with memories. What is your memory in all the pictures of somebody young, not all of them, but in many of our pictures, there's sailor suits and, and caps and, and uh, knickers. And so if you put people in that, they immediately, in my opinion, go to photographs of their own family. So it's, it's connect the dots. It's not just having somebody stand in a mug shot. Well, actually, it's only a head shot, see, it's hair and makeup. But uh, it, you you know that those little suits, and if you put a sailor suit on a boy, or it, it uh, and also to be able to put something something like a Diego Luna suit, something like that on Salma, you start that transition very early. And also what really got me was the number of background players you had to dress. Oh my God, it wasn't like three or four people milling around but in the background. There's so many backgrounds. And we all know that as as costume designers, that when we read the first script, it says, man enters and sits on park bench, lonely. And then the next time it's, man enters, sits in park bench, parade passes in the distance. Yeah. Aspiring parade, as parade passes in distance, four words. Aspiring costume designers take note. There is another thing. I said this, and it's a good way to end. You take what you want, and you leave the rest behind, and you combine it with yourself, and you go forward with your arms open to embrace those who you normally would not. There you go, visually.